from heaven, where are written the names of the predestined. All this the mother of mercy knew, and she wept over his fate most bitterly, praying for the welfare of men and for their salvation from such great blindness and ruinous destruction. Yet in all this she conformed herself to the just and hidden decrees of divine providence. Instruction which the Queen of Heaven, Mary, gave me. My daughter, thou art astonished, not without cause, at what thou hast learned and recorded of the unhappy fate of Judas and the fall of the apostles, who were all disciples in the school of Christ, nursed at his breast by this doctrine, by the example of his life and by his miracles, enjoying his sweetest and gentlest intercourse, and many other benefits of my assistance and intercession. But I truly say to thee, if all the children of the church would attentively consider this example, they would find a salutary exhortation and warning in this mortal state of life against the danger surrounding them, even in the midst of the favors and blessings they continually receive at the hands of the Lord. All of them cannot be equal to seeing him with bodily eyes and having intercourse with him as the living image of all sanctity. The apostles received from me personal exhortations, and they were eyewitnesses of my blameless blameless and holy conduct <clears throat> they received great tokens of my kindness and my charity flowed directly from god through me upon them if they in the very act of receiving such favors and in the presence of their god and savior forgot all of them, and all of their obligation of corresponding to them, who then shall be so presumptuous in their mortal life as not to fear the danger of eternal ruin, no matter how many favors he has received from the Almighty? They were apostles chosen by their divine master, their true God, yet one of them fell lower than any other individual of the human race, and the others failed in faith, the foundation of all virtue, yet all this was conformable to the just judgments of the Most High. Why then should those who are not apostles be without fear, who have not so labored in the school of Christ, and who have not so merited my intercession? Concerning the perdition of Judas, and of his most just punishment, thou hast written enough in order to set forth to what extremes a man can be brought by yielding to vices and to the devil, and by refusing to hear and follow the pleading of grace. I, moreover, inform thee, that not only the torments of the traitorous disciple Judas, but also those of many other Christians, who condemn themselves and shall be sent to the same place of punishment which was assigned to them and Judas from the beginning of the world, are greater than the torments of many demons. For my most holy Son did not die for the angels, but for men, nor were the fruits and results of the redemption for the demon, but entirely at the disposal of the children of the church in the holy sacraments. The contempt for those incomparable benefits is not properly the sin of the devils, but of the Christians, and therefore they must expect a special and appropriate punishment for this contempt. The mistake of not having recognized Christ as the true God causes the deepest and most tormenting regret to Lucifer and his evil spirits for all eternity. Hence, on account of this error, they are filled with special wrath against those who were redeemed, particularly against the Christians who derived the greater benefits from the redemption and the blood of the Lamb. That is why the devils are so eager to cause forgetfulness and misuse of these graces in them, and why afterwards in hell they are permitted to vent so much the greater fury and wrath upon the wicked Christians. If it were not for the equitable dispositions of divine justice by which the pains are proportioned to the guilt, they would wreck still fiercer vengeance upon them. But the goodness of the Lord extends even to this place, and restrains the malice of the demons by his infinite power and wisdom. In the fall of the other eleven apostles, I wish, my dearest, that thou learn the frailty of human nature, since even in such great blessings and favors received of the Lord, it easily falls into the habit of gross negligence and ingratitude, such as the apostles manifested in flying from their heavenly master and leaving him in the spirit of doubt. In the spirit of doubt, men incur this danger from their earthly and sensuous inclinations the result of past sins and of the habits formed by a terrestrial, carnal, and sensuous life, void of spirituality. On account of it, they desire and love the divine favors and benefits only in a carnal manner. As soon as they fail to find that kind of enjoyment in them, they turn to other sensible enjoyments, are moved by them, and lose the true conception of a spiritual life, for they treat it with and estimate it according 
to the low standard of mere sensuality. Hence the apostles, though they were so greatly favored by my most holy son, fell into such gross heedlessness and sins, for the miracles, the teachings, and the examples affected them only in a sensible manner, and as they, in spite of their being raised to justice and perfection, permitted themselves to be affected by them only outwardly, yet they only outwardly they were presently disturbed by temptation and yielded to it they acted like men who had done little to penetrate into the mysteries and into the spirit of what they had seen and heard in the school of their master by this example my daughter and by my teachings thou oughtest to be well instructed a spiritual disciple of mine and not a terrestrial accustoming accustoming thyself to despise more mere outwardness even in favors bestowed upon me by the Lord or myself. When thou receivest them, do not attach thyself merely to the material or sensible in them, but raise thy mind to the exalted and the spiritual contained therein, to that which is perceived by the interior and spiritual, and not by the animal senses. 1 Corinthians 2.14 If even the merely sensible can hinder the spiritual life, how much is this true of that which pertains altogether to earthly, animal, and carnal life? Clearly I desire of thee to forget and blot out of thy faculties all images and remembrances of mere creatures, in order that thou mayest be fit to receive my salutary teaching and be, be capable of imitating me. Jesus the Savior, bound as a prisoner, is dragged to the house of Annas, what happened in connection therewith, and what the Most Blessed Mother suffered during that time. Fit were it to speak of the suffering, the affronts, the death of our Savior Jesus in such vivid and efficacious words that they enter into the soul like a two-edged sword, piercing with deepest sorrow our inmost hearts. Hebrew 4, Hebrews 4.13 Not of an ordinary kind were the pains he suffered, and there is no sorrow like unto his sorrow. For his body was not like the bodies of the rest of men, nor did the Lord suffer for himself, nor for his own sins, but for us and for our sins. 1 Peter 2. 21. Hence the words and expressions by which we describe his torments and sorrows should not be of the common or ordinary kind, but woe is me who cannot give sufficient force to my words and cannot find those my soul seeks in order to manifest this mystery. I will speak according to my capacity and as far as is given me. Sorry, I had to decline a call. I will speak according to my capacity and as far and as far as is given me, although my powers constrain and limit the greatness of what I understand, and my inadequate words cannot reach the secret concepts of the heart. Let then the vividness and force of the faith which we profess as children of the church supply what is defective in my words. If our words are but of the ordinary kind, let our compassion and our sorrow be extraordinary. Let our thoughts be of the loftiest, our comprehension most real, our consideration of the deepest, our thankfulness heartfelt, and our love most fervent, for all that we can do shall fall short of what the reality de demands, of what we owe as servants, as friends, and as children adopted through his most sacred passion and death. Having been taken prisoner and firmly bound, the most meek lamb Jesus was dragged from the garden to the house of the high priest, first to the house of Annas, John 18.13. The turbulent band of soldiers and servants, having been advised by the traitorous disciple that his master was a sorcerer and could easily escape their hands if they did not carefully bind and chain him securely before starting on their way, took all precautions inspired by such a mistrust, Mark 14.44. Lucifer and his companions <clears throat> Lucifer and his compeers of darkness secretly irritated and provoked them to increase their impious and sacrilegious ill treatment of the Lord beyond all bounds of humanity and decency. As they were willing accomplices of Lucifer's malice, they omitted no outrage against the person of their creator within the limits set by the Almighty. They bound him with a heavy iron chain with such ingenuity that it encircled as well the waist as the neck. The two ends of the chain, which remained free, were attached to large rings or handcuffs, 
with which they manacled the hands of the Lord, who created the heavens, the angels, and the whole universe. The hands thus secured and bound, they fastened not in front but behind. This chain they had brought from the house of Annas, the high priest, where it had served to raise the portcullis of a dungeon. They had wrenched it from its place and provided it with padlock handcuffs. But they were not satisfied with this unheard-of way of securing a prisoner, for in their distress they added two pieces of strong rope, the one they wound around the throat of Jesus, and crossing it at the breast, bound it in heavy knots all about the body, leaving two long ends free in front in order that the servants and soldiers might jerk him in different directions along the way. The second rope served to tie his arms, being bound likewise around his waist. The two ends of this rope were left hanging free to be used by other two executioners for jerking him from behind. In this manner, the Almighty and Holy One permitted himself to be bound and made helpless, as if he were the most criminal of men and the weakest of the woman born. <clears throat> For he had taken upon himself all the iniquities and weaknesses of our sins. Isaiah 53, 6. They bound him in the garden, adding to the chains and ropes insulting blows and vilest language. For like venomous serpents, they shot forth their sacrilegious poison and abuse and blasphemy against him who is adored by angels and men, and who is magnified in heaven and on earth. They left the Garden of Olives in great tumult and uproar, guarding the Savior in their midst. Some of them dragged him along by the ropes in front, and the others retarded his steps by the ropes hanging from the handcuffs behind. In this manner, with a violence unheard of, they sometimes forced him to run forward in haste, frequently causing him to fall. At others, they jerked him backwards, and then again they pulled him from one side to the other, according to their diabolical whims. Many times they violently threw him to the ground, and as his hands were tied behind, he fell upon it with his divine countenance and was severely wounded and lacerated. Oh. In, this, in his falls they pronounced upon him, inflicting blows and kicks, trampling upon his body and upon his head and face. All these de deviltries they accom accompanied with festive shouts and opprobrious insults, as was foretold by Jeremiah's. 3.30 During all this time, Lucifer, while inciting these ministers of evil, watched all the actions and movements of our Savior. His patience he thus put to the test in order to find out whether Jesus was only a man, for this doubt and perplexity tormented his wicked pride above all others. As he was obliged to acknowledge the meekness, patience, and sweetness of Christ, his serene majesty, without change or disturbance, amid all these injuries and sufferings, the infernal dragon was enraged only so much the more, and at one time, like one crazed by fury, he attempted to seize the ropes in order that he and his fellow demons might pull at them more violently than his human foes, and thus perhaps overcome the meekness of the Savior. But he was withheld by the Most Holy Mary, who... From her retreat by a clear vision saw all that happened to her divine son when she noticed this attempt of lucifer she made use of her power as sovereign queen and commanded him to desist all strength immediately left lucifer and he could not proceed in his presumptuous intent it was not becoming that his malice should add to the sufferings and death of the redeemer in such a manner he was however given permission to excite all his fellow demons against the lord and these again were left a free hand to incite his mortal enemies among the Jews, since the latter had, to lib had liberty of will and to consent or not. Lucifer used this freedom to its full extent, and therefore said to the other evil spirits, quote, What kind of man is this, born into the world, who by his patience and by his works so torments us and annihilates us? None ever maintained such equanimity and such long-suffering and tribulations since the time of Adam until now. Never have we found among mortals such humility and meekness. How can we rest when we see in the world such a rare and powerful example, drawing others to him? If this is the Messiah, he will certainly open heaven and close up the highway by which we have so far led men into our eternal torments. We shall be vanquished, and all our plans will be frustrated. Even if he is but a mere creature, or even if he is but a mere man, I cannot permit such an example for the rest of mankind. Haste, then, ministers of my exalted power, let us persecute him through his human foes, who, obedient to my sway, have conceived of me some 
of our own furious envy, unquote. The author of our salvation, hiding his power of annihilating his enemies in order that our redemption might be the more abundant, submitted to all the consequences of the impious fury which Lucifer and his hellish squadron fomented in the Jews. Fomented in the Jews. They dragged him, bound and chained, under continued ill-treatment to the house of Annas, before whom they presented him as a malefactor worthy of death. It was the custom of the Jews to present thus bound those criminals who merited capital punishment, and they now made use of this custom in regard to Jesus, in order to intimate his sentence even before the trial. The sacrilegious priest Annas seated himself in proud and arrogant state on the platform or tribunal of a great hall. Immediately Lucifer placed himself at his side with a multitude of evil spirits. The servants and soldiers brought before him Jesus, bound and fettered, and said, quote, at last we bring hither this wicked man, who by his sorceries and evil deeds has disturbed all Jerusalem and Judea. This time his magic art has not availed him to escape our hands and power. Unquote. And that's where I'll stop for now. All glory be to our Master and God, Jesus. May God bless and keep you.